Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. It is the third week of Advent. Would you stand? We're going to sing some songs together to celebrate this week.
Morning. Today is the third Sunday in the season of Advent, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Advent is an important season for the church. While the world around us is ablaze with holiday fervor, the church pauses at Advent to acknowledge the darkness of this world and long for the day when Jesus will return and make all things new. Advent begins in the dark when the candles of Advent, the Advent wreath are unlit. Each week, we light another candle as we journey toward the light of Christmas, Jesus, God with us. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. Joseph, worn out traveler and worried husband, trudging through the darkness of this world for the sake of his family. There was no room for him, yet God's presence was near and the joy of the Lord would soon break through. Joseph reminds us of the joy that can come even amidst the pain and brokenness of this world. For even when the way seems dark, God's presence is light to the path. This is the joy of Christmas. I'm sorry. Um, there really is joy in the midst of pain and brokenness. I know this because for three and a half years, I took care of my father who had diabetes, dementia, and pancreatic cancer. And I just thank God that he chose me out of all of my siblings to be the one to take care of my father and to be there for him in his last days. And it's a joy to know that I will see my father again. As the young adult intern, it has been a joy to serve alongside Dan and Christy Hawkins, who have opened their home and created a safe space for our young adults to be in community with one another. It has been a joy to witness our group of young adults share meals together, laugh together, open the word of God together, engage in theological discussions, and be vulnerable and honest about who we are, what we believe, and be open to sharing about the hard things in their lives. It has been a joy to watch them support and encourage one another. And I look forward to the time with them on our Sabbath retreat as we experience what it means to give God our full and undivided attention while we rest in him. Let us pray. God of all joy, May we be reminded today of the light you bring to our darkness, the joy your presence brings amidst our brokenness. In this season, may we experience your joy everlasting. Amen. On the third week of Advent, we light the third candle of the Advent wreath called the Candle of Joy. May it remind us that the true joy of Christmas is found in the presence of God with us. Thanks be to God. Now's the time we're going to dismiss the kids up through fifth grade. Whoa. Now's the time we're going to dismiss kids up through fifth grade. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Grand Kirk Church. We're thankful to have you here in this third week of Lent, the week before we celebrate the birth and first coming of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. I'm Steve Sharp, one of your elders and lay pastors. If you're new to Glen Kirk or just visiting, a special welcome to you. Please introduce yourself to one of the pastors or elders uh, or anybody from Glen Kirk on the patio following the service. Whether you're here or in person or worshiping from home, we'd love to hear from you on your connection card found in your bulletin. So if you could just take out and if you have a prayer request or a praise you'd like to offer, those are read every week and prayed over. 
Um, but you'll find that in your in your uh, in the connection in the connection card found in the in the bulletin. You can also access the connection card, submit prayer requests, or request information to the Glen Kirk Church app. There it is. We'd especially love to hear from you if you're new with us today. I'd invite everyone who's in person to fill out, tear out that card, and when the collection plate comes through in a few moments, just to drop that in. Please make note of Christmas Eve service times in your bulletin. We'll have just one morning service that morning at 10 a.m. This will be our traditional uh, breakfast in Bethlehem e evening event geared toward families with children. Come in your PJs for the service and stay for crafts and pancakes on the patio. The evening we'll have two candlelight services, one at six o'clock and the other at eight o'clock. Child care will be available for the 6 p.m. service for children that are three and under. And then today after this service, uh, they're, they're go to the gathering place where our engaged youth ministry will reveal their high school student summer trip location. So please join us there. Pastor Kate will be sharing a message from God's word today. So let's prepare our hearts. Please join me in prayer as we bow our heads together. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Help us remember that all good gifts come from you and that this gift of the Redeemer in particular is one meant to be shared. Help us be faithful keepers of your goodness, those allowing the Spirit to flow through us without restraint. Enable us to faithfully and ever effectively reflect your goodness, love, kindness, and grace to all we meet, always for your glory. Almighty God, please anoint Pastor Kate's words in today's message as she preaches from Matthew's Gospel. Make her words yours, stirring and preparing hearts to serve you and reflect your glory within a world desperately needing Christ. Loving Creator, so many can be discouraged during this season of salvation in our Lord. They might be particularly mindful of loss, disappointments, sensitive to things seeming so much less than your best. Comfort these, showing them your majesty and love anew. And Lord, we lift up the Noit family today. They experienced a, a very challenging auto accident in the last few days. So we just pray your healing touch upon them, your peace, that they would be recovered. And Lord, that you, you would be glorified therein. Father God, please bring your peace and reconciliation also to Israel, to the Ukraine, and all places where strife, violence, and exploitation distort your image within people you've created for loving relationship with you. Please still hearts inclined toward discard or violence. Quicken spirits to prepare the way for the Savior, the Prince of Peace, and Redeemer of fallen creation. Help us to trust fully and solely in you, the one who paid the ultimate price in ransoming us from the ravages of sin and death. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Come, Lord, and stay with us. Come and occupy the throne of our hearts. Reign there without a rival and consecrate us fully to your service. O oh God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Help us embrace your peace in the person of the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate, especially in this season. Help us not only adore him, but assist others in coming to saving knowledge of the only one worthy of such praise and adoration. We lift these things to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. So if you're worshiping through giving this morning, this is the time for us to give thanks to God for his provision. Your offering supports Glen Kirk's various ministries and partners. If you're here in person, you can put your offering in the plate as it comes in just a moment. And again, if you have a connection card, hopefully you fill that out, have a prayer request or a praise, drop that in when the plate comes by. You can also give by going to the glenkirkchurch.org forward slash give app or using our text to give phone number. Should be on the screen. There it is. Now the ushers will come forward to receive this morning's offering. Let's worship God with thanks and praise for all he's done for us.
Good morning. I love to go backpacking. And now it's been a few years doing to having babies and everything, but I look forward to when I can get back out on the trail. And I've found that when you tell people you like backpacking, you get one of two reactions. If you're talking to someone who also loves backpacking, you inevitably talk about what kind of gear you use and what trails you like. And if you're an ultra light or comfort backpacker, but the more common response I get when I tell people that I like backpacking is some form of, 
I don't understand why you would want to do that. And I get it, honestly. There are significant downsides to the whole thing. Sore feet, blisters, sleeping on the ground, eating freeze-dried food, mosquitoes, no indoor plumbing, and of course, carrying the heavy pack. There are real negatives. And just because you like backpacking doesn't mean that you've figured out a way to get around all that. Mitigate it a little bit, sure, but avoid it altogether, no. With backpacking, pain is just a part of the journey. There's no way around it. But here's the thing. There is joy in backpacking as well. The freedom of being out in the wilderness with no cell phone or internet or TV. The idea that you get to determine your own steps and climb a mountain or trek through a valley. Even the idea of um, this great quality time with the people that you're hiking with, with very few distractions. And of course, the beautiful views that you get to see. Views that so few get to see because you have to hike in three or four or five days in order to get there. And when you're up there at 14,000 feet in a high mountain meadow, you'd swear that's what heaven looks like. So yes, backpacking is painful. It's part of the trip, there's no way around it. But there are good parts to backpacking as well. Sure, you have to carry the heavy pack, but you also get to see the beautiful majesty of God's creation. Both are a part of the deal, and joy breaks through the pain of the trail. Today is the third Sunday in Advent, the season leading up to our celebration of God with us at Christmas. Author and Episcopal priest Fleming Rutledge has said that Advent isn't for the faint of heart. Perhaps that's because in this season, we acknowledge the pain of life and we hold space for the longing that we have for it all to be made right in the end. This is an important practice for us as Christians because only in facing the dark are the lights of Christmas truly authentic. So every week we have been talking about darkness and we've been starting the sermon portion of the service out in a little more darkness than we are used to. And we've let the lights grow. And we've been looking at different parts of the Christmas story and how the light of Jesus breaks through in each one. The first week we looked at Mary, a young Jewish woman living in occupied Israel. Her and her people were longing for God's Messiah to come and set them free from oppression. And in her story, in her darkness, the light of hope is sparked as she's promised to bear the Messiah. Mary's story teaches us how the light of hope can meet us in the darkness of our own longing and despair. Last week, we looked at the shepherds, how they were living in the midst of what Rome called peace on earth, a peace that came through war and terror and occupation, a peace that was no peace at all. And then the angels came and spoke to them the message of God's true peace, God's shalom. The shepherd's story teaches us how the light of peace can break through the world's darkness of hostility and fear. And this morning we turn to Joseph and a part of the Christmas story that we don't usually tell. This part of the story is perhaps the darkest, but through this story, we see how the light of joy can break through even the darkest part of our story. How joy breaks through amidst the pain of the trail because of Jesus, our light in the darkness. So if you are willing and able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning from Matthew chapter two, verses 13 through 21. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years and younger in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted 
because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life or dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, if you're curious where this part of the story lands in the timeline of the nativity story, I hope that this helps a little bit. Our passage this morning happens after the angel comes to Mary, after Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth, after the angels announce Jesus' birth to the shepherds, and directly following the Magi's visit to Jesus to bring him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We are not sure how long after the Magi's arrival that was, but we know that they came somewhere in the first two years of Jesus's life on earth, and that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were still in Bethlehem, where they had gone for the census. But the wise men first go to Herod, the regional king of Judea, and they ask him where this king of the Jews was born. Their visit made Herod aware of the birth of Jesus and Herod wanted him destroyed. The the wise men did not report back exactly where Jesus was born, so all that Herod knew was that the baby was born somewhere in the Bethlehem region. And so he called for all the baby boys in that whole area to be killed, any who were two years and younger. And this would have taken the life of Jesus along with the others, except that an angel comes to Joseph in a dream and warns him and tells him to flee to the land of Egypt and stay there until Herod dies. Then an angel of God comes to Joseph and tells him that he can go back. And just after our passage this morning, another angel comes to Joseph in a dream and tells him not to go to Bethlehem, but to Nazareth to avoid further danger. We don't usually hear this part of the story at Christmas time. This part of the story doesn't usually make it into sermons or nativity scenes or kids' Christmas books. We usually tell the story that comes out of Luke chapters one and two and Matthew two, and we jump around a little bit. We hear of the angel visiting Mary and sometimes of the angel first visiting Joseph. We hear of the angels announcing the birth to the shepherds and sometimes of the magi bringing their gifts. But this part of the passage, We don't usually hear this part. Christmas, after all, is about the hope, peace, joy, and love that Jesus brings us at Christmas. And this passage, that's not about any of those. This part of the story isn't about having a merry little Christmas. This part of the story isn't about a silent night. This part of the story is about the darkness of this world. And we don't usually hear this part of the story at Christmas because this isn't a Christmas story, but it is an Advent story. Advent is a different season from Christmas. In Advent, the church looks squarely at the brokenness of this world, the death and the the destruction and the sorrow. Advent is not a fanciful time for the idea that all our troubles will be miles away. In Advent, we acknowledge that things are not as they should be and that a lot of that will not be fixed this side of eternity. This world is disproportionate with suffering and injustice and pain and loss. This world could never save us. It is far too broken, too cruel. In the words of Fleming Rutledge, in Advent we stare into the darkness until we exclaim, no wonder God had to send Jesus to save us. And this story of Joseph's dreams and the family's flight to Egypt and the massacre of the innocents, this is the culmination of Advent, the darkest part of the story, the darkest part of the night before the dawn. And because we don't normally hear this part of the story, we don't have a full picture of who Joseph was because Joseph only really appears in the nativity stories in Matthew and in Luke. He appears a little bit in the story about Jesus being presented at the temple and mentioned in the story of Jesus getting lost when he was 12. 
But Joseph isn't mentioned at all in the Gospel of Mark and only in the Gospel of John when people identify Jesus as the son of Joseph. And none of his words are recorded in Scripture. The primary passage in which Joseph appears is this one, and it fills out the picture that we have of Joseph. The story teaches us that he was a man who consistently heard from God and who oriented his life around what God told him to do. He was obedient to the word of God on his life. He was a man loyal to his family, willing to do anything it took to keep them safe. He was a man of dreams. So much so that the scriptures tell us that an angel visited him in dreams four times within 26 verses. And that's reminiscent of another Joseph in scripture, isn't it? It sounds a lot like the Joseph made famous by his technicolor dream coat. We read about that Joseph in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and their stories have a good amount of overlap. Let's take a quick look at what I mean. Joseph, in the Gospel of Matthew, was the son of a man named Jacob. We learn this in the first chapter of Matthew in the genealogy of Jesus. And similarly, in the Old Testament, Joseph was also the son of a man named Jacob. Joseph, in the Gospel of Matthew, frequently heard from God in dreams. And similarly, Joseph, in the Old Testament, heard from God in dreams and was able to interpret the dreams of others. Joseph in the Gospel of Matthew saved his family by taking them out of Israel and into Egypt. And Joseph of the Old Testament, too, saved his family from famine in Israel and providing them food in Egypt. Both Josephs are involved in stories much bigger than their own. God partners with both of them to protect the people, the family of God. And both stories the Joseph's obedience is vital to the redemptive work that God is doing in the world. But the story of Joseph with his technicolor dream coat is not the only Old Testament story referenced in this passage. Because just after Herod orders the killing of all the boys, the author of Matthew quotes an Old Testament passage. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is a passage taken from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31, verse 15. And in this picture of sorrow, Rachel, who is the wife of Jacob and the mother of Joseph in the Old Testament, is portrayed as a kind of national mother of Israel, weeping over her children the people of Israel, as they are plundered and pillaged and taken into captivity in Babylon. And the author of Matthew knows these prophets' words well, and he claims that they not only allude to Israel's fate with Babylon, but also, centuries later, to the mourning of the boys in the time of Jesus. Because the agony of both stories are similar. Unthinkable pain best represented by a mother that is inconsolable, over the loss of her children. Because both the plundering and pillaging and slavery of the people of Israel by the Babylonians and the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem are a result of God's people being ruled by a foreign power. Babylon in the Old Testament, the Roman Empire in the New, they are heartbreaking stories that point to nothing else other than the darkness of this world and a people in desperate need of a savior. So why preach on this passage in the third Sunday of Advent? After all, the third Sunday of Advent is supposed to be about joy. We light the joy candle. And it could be argued that there is no joy in this passage, but I would argue differently for two main reasons. First, the author of Matthew quotes the prophet Jeremiah from chapter 31. And if you were to flip your pages of your Bible back and read that chapter, you would definitely see a picture of sorrow and pain and brokenness, but the prophet also dares to speak of joy. They will come with weeping, he says, in the words of God, the words of Yahweh, and I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. 
And just like a breathtaking view at the top of a high mountain pass at the end of a grueling day of backpacking, joy breaks through amidst the pain. Because the joy of our God is rebellious, refusing to let darkness have the only say. So the first reason I would argue that joy shows up in our passage this morning is because of this quoting of the prophet Jeremiah. This is a veiled reference to future joy for any who would venture to see it there. The second reason I would argue that joy is found in this passage comes from the very complex idea of, of joy that's found in scripture. There isn't just one simple definition of joy in the Bible. There are many, with many different Hebrew and Greek words to describe it. In our culture, we would probably say that joy or happiness is a inward feeling, a good feeling inside of us. And there is definitely that definition of joy in scripture. It's a legitimate definition according to the Bible. But one of the most compelling ideas of joy is very different from that one. And this particular idea of joy isn't a good feeling that comes from within us. It's a gift given from God when God shows up in the midst of our darkness. And this picture of joy is found throughout scripture. It's a popular one because the people of God are very familiar with this idea as God shows up over and over and over again in the midst of their darkness. And sometimes when God shows up, the presence of God brings complete deliverance. You might think of when God parts the Red Sea and allows the children of Israel to escape slavery in Egypt. God's presence in that story brought deliverance and extreme jubilation. But it doesn't always bring deliverance. And more often than not, God's presence with the people of Israel, the joy is simply God's presence with them. You might think of when the children of Israel are wandering in the desert for 40 years, but God is with them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night not complete deliverance for they're wandering for 40 years, <laughs> but God's presence is with them in it. And that sparks joy in the people of God. One of the most well-known Psalms speaks of this kind of joy. Psalms 30 says, sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. In other words, sorrow and pain, they're a part of life. You can count on it, just like you can count on the night coming every 24 hours. But just as the sun rose yesterday, we can count on the sun rising again tomorrow. Just as God was faithful to show up in the past, we can count on God showing up again in the future. And that joy is the light that shines in our darkness. Perhaps this is why the joy of the Lord is said to be our strength. Have you ever wondered why the joy of the Lord would be our strength? <laughs> How could a good feeling make us strong? Feelings come and go. Feelings are things that are affected by our, our circumstances. But the kind of joy that comes with the presence of God, with God's people, now that kind of joy speaks of strength. I can imagine how that would be our strength. And this is why I argue that joy shows up in our passage. Because time and again, God shows up in the midst of darkness. In fact, God showing up might be the single most uh, common occurrence in Joseph's, in Joseph's life. No matter what's happening in his life, no matter what's going wrong, God is showing up. Messengers from God are bringing messages to him. When his fiance Mary got pregnant and, he, and it seemed she had been unfaithful to him, God showed up. When evil seemed to rage against the plans of God and his family was in danger, God showed up. And after what might have been years of living in a foreign land with little hope of returning to his former life, God shows up. And when he might have misstepped and brought his family back into danger, God showed up. 
And when God shows up in the midst of our darkness, it sparks joy in the people of God. Joy is present in this story because no matter what Joseph was facing, God is showing up in the midst of fear and danger and inconsolable sorrow. In the darkest parts of Joseph's story, God showed up, reminding Joseph he was not alone. And that's the message of Christmas, isn't it? That in our darkness, Jesus came down to be the light. That while we were still broken, God came for us. So what does this mean for us at Advent? I was talking to one of my best friends this week and she was updating me on some things that were going on in her life. Her parents' poor health and continued treatment, her father-in-law being hospitalized again, and her mother-in-law having this mystery illness that the doctor still can't figure out what's going on. And she said to me, no wonder I can't feel the joy of Christmas Everyone around me is suffering. My mom told me the other day about an interesting conversation she had with the cashier at the grocery store. My mom tends to go to the same grocery store every time she goes and the same line in the grocery store, so she gets to know this cashier pretty well. And she asked him what his plans were for Christmas, and he said, I'm not doing Christmas this year. And when she asked why, he said, I'm still mad at him. He took my mom the day after Christmas last year. And my mom, who has experienced her own amount of loss in the last few years, expressed sympathy for him. And he said to her, you at least have kids to celebrate with. I have nobody. I have my sister and she's undergoing cancer treatment. I'm all alone. I'm not doing Christmas this year. Sometimes the season leading up to Christmas doesn't feel like a season leading up to Christmas at all. It feels like Christmas is here and you've got to get on board and feel the magic of Christmas or you're doing it wrong. And there's this pressure to push down all the suffering and pain and pretend like it's not there so you can feel the joy of Christmas. And at some point, we as the global church have failed to tell the Christmas story if people like my friend or the cashier think that they can't celebrate it because of the season they're in. Because the joy of Christmas, the joy of the Christmas story is that God came into our brokenness. That in our brokenness, God came and the true joy of Christmas is found in the presence of God with us in the darkness. And when we read the nativity story, the whole nativity story, we realize that it's not only okay, but completely appropriate if the only joy that we have this Christmas is that God comes in as a light into our darkness. This is why I've come to love Advent. Advent is not a time for the fanciful idea that all our troubles will be miles away. In Advent, we acknowledge that things are not as they should be and that this world is filled with suffering and injustice and pain and loss. This world is broken and cruel. And it may not all be fixed this side of eternity. And as we sit in the longing for things to be made right, we are made aware that we are not left alone in that longing. That just as Jesus came at the first Christmas, we can count on Jesus coming again. Because in Advent, we look back at when Jesus showed up in our darkness before so that we have faith that God will show up again in our darkness now. And in the meantime, God is with us in our longing because of Jesus. And Jesus is inviting my friend who is carrying the suffering of her family and that cashier who is in his season of loss to bring it to him. Because he can be present for them too, shining a little light into their darkness this Christmas. So for some of you, 
This sermon may have caught you completely off guard this morning. I apologize for that. (laughs) Perhaps this season is one of typical joy for you. And I have to say that that's okay. It's okay to find joy in the lights and the presents and the tree. It's okay to celebrate with family and friends and good food. That kind of joy is in scripture and it's to be celebrated. But if you are not having that feeling of joy this Christmas, that's okay too. If you, like the cashier, are thinking you can't do Christmas this year because no matter what you're carrying, you can't figure out how to make that joy come, I want you to know that no matter what you're battling, no matter what you're fighting, no matter what you're carrying, you do not need to push it down or ignore it or pretend it's not there. In this last week leading up to Christmas, remember that Jesus is no stranger to the sorrow and pain of life. Jesus doesn't need you to pretend life is easy in order to celebrate God with us at Christmas. Advent is this bold reminder that no matter what you are going through, Jesus can come as a light into your darkness. Advent is a bold reminder that although all our suffering and sorrow may not be made right the sight of eternity, we are not alone in it. Advent reminds us that God's joy doesn't require us to ignore the pain and brokenness around or within us. It reminds us that just as God has shown up in the past in a manger on the first Christmas night, God can show up this Christmas and will show up at the end of all things to make everything right. And while that may not fill us with the warm, happy feeling kind of joy, it can remind us of the joy that comes when God's light and presence is with us in our darkness. Because in life, like in backpacking, pain is just a part of the journey. There's no way around it. But in life, like in backpacking, joy breaks through amidst the pain because of Jesus, because of Christmas, because of that beautiful name of Jesus, our light in the darkness. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you came as a light in our darkness. In this last week before Christmas, may we experience you with us, and may that spark the light of joy in us, your people. And as more and more light pours forth from the Advent candles, as light builds little by little, week by week, may we pay attention to that because that's what you do for us. That's who you are for us. Jesus, our true light in the darkness. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing this last song again. You were the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is.
worshiping with us today. We hope you'll come back next week to celebrate Christmas Eve at 10 a.m. and 6 and 8 p.m. We'd love to see you there. If you're here this morning and you're carrying a heavy burden and you would like some prayer, some elders are gonna be up here on the left of the platform. They would love to pray with you, remind you that you're not carrying that alone. And now hear this benediction as a blessing on your week. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our true light in the darkness, be upon you. In difficult times, may Jesus' presence be a source of joy for you, whether you're feeling Christmassy or not. And may the joy of the Lord be your everlasting strength. Amen. Go in peace.